Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Commander of Cash podcast. This week, we are going to be doing a tier list of the best one-drop creatures in Commander. And joined with me, as always, for this discussion is Seth, probably better known as Sofran Olive. How's it going, Seth? I'm doing great, Tomer. How are you? Good to see you. I'm doing great, doing great. I'm here in Paris, so a little bit of a time Ooh. zone difference. I'm in, I'm in fill time now. Living, living the fill see, life. <laughs> you can see that it's uh, dark outside, and it's probably bright and sunny where you're at, so yeah. nice. <laughs> um, and next up we got, well, Phil, a.k.a. Brewer's Kitchen. How's it going, Phil? Same time zone. Pretty dark. Um, <laughs> yeah. Nothing much else. <laughs> yeah. And then finally, last but certainly not least, is Krim, a.k.a. the Asian Avenger. How's it going, Krim? Uh, good morning. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it goes. It goes. <laughs> Yep, it is morning. It is it morning. Is I'm awake. <laughs> yes. I'm here. Yes. <laughs> All right. Very sweet. So again, we are going to be doing uh, one drop creatures in Commander. And we're, we we have a full list. Uh, we, we covered over 25-ish cards and we ranked all of them. So if you want to see our full ranking, you can find that in the uh, description below, in the video description. Or if you're listening to this in the podcast, check out our article on mtggoldfish.com. We're going to have the full list over there. We've selected like 9 or 12 or so cards that we thought are interesting to talk about um, you know if we think maybe they're undervalued or if we don't have a good consensus on them just stuff that we were we thought were particularly interesting to talk about uh, in Commander. But before we begin, uh, a couple reminders. First, if you want to support the channel, you could do so two different ways. Uh, the first way is if you want to give us some money, you can head on over to mggoldfishmerch.com and you can purchase our deck boxes, deck sleeves, t-shirts, and so much more over there. And the second way you can support the channel, it costs no money at all, you can just like and subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast. The equivalent of liking or subscribing on Spotify, Apple, iTunes, or, or YouTube, wherever you're listening to this, uh, give that a little, give that a little, little, little click uh, the, the uptick. It's great. Um, all right. So now we begin with our list. Let's kick it off with Seth. What do you got for us? Who? All right. We have a one drop that I think is actually pretty underrated and uh, way better than people might think. And that is Hopeful Initiate. So it's one might mana. It's a human warlock, which the human part's sometimes relevant. It's a one two as training. So whenever it attacks with a creature with greater power, it gets a plus one plus one counter. And then you can pay three mana and remove two plus one plus one counters from among any creatures you control. So not just say any of your creatures and you blow up an artifact or enchantment. So this is a card that according to EDH rec is played in very few decks, like 1% of decks, even in human decks, it's not really a staple, less than 50%, usually around like 30% of the popular human decks are actually running this card. And I think this card is actually just really solid. Like a one mana two one is not a bad base to start off of. It is likely going to grow as you attack with other creatures. And then we all know in commander, there's some really strong artifacts and enchantments. And even though three mana isn't super efficient, it's repeatable. So throughout the course of the game, if anyone plays a threatening artifact or enchantment, this should be able to clean it up. You can even activate it at instant speed. It goes up even more in value in like a plus one plus one counter theme deck where you can have lots of counters on your things. So uh, as far as our ratings on this card, uh, uh oh, where did it go on our list? Hopeful initiate. I, I believe I have it as an A and everyone else has it as a B, which uh, makes it a, a B average overall for the group. But I think it deserves to see more play than that. Like, I think you can play this in generic, like white aggro decks. I think it seems great in humans. I think it seems great in plus one, plus one counter decks. So this is one of those one drops that I just, I don't think it gets the credit it deserves for what it does in the commander format. Yeah. I had to read it again once I saw it on this list that you can move counters from all your creatures. It is a 1-2 for 1, which is probably better with training uh, than a 2-1. Helps it grow a uh, little bit faster, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I still have it at a B because I would really want to make sure that I can, that I have an excessive amount of tokens, uh, counters flying around that I can just use for this. But once I can... Wow, this will get rid of a lot of things. So, yeah, I might be one of the people underrating this. I didn't think about playing this in Commander, but I also didn't think about removing counters from everywhere. I just see it removing its yeah. own counters sometimes in Explorer or something, but... 
If it's yeah, itself, it it's pretty it's good. Definitely a lot worse because then you need to like attack twice with it to get the training twice. So it's a lot harder. But the fact that you can just yoink counters out of anything, and then even has more upside if you have like persist or other oh, things yeah. where you like <laughs> can actively benefit from removing counters from your stuff, which is kind of a fringe thing. But there are decks that can like take advantage of that by resetting their persist creatures or whatever. I, I don't know. I I think this card is accurately rated. Right. I mean, it's. It's okay. Like it, it, it's even though it can remove counters from everything, I have it exactly out of B because the only purpose I feel like I have for it is is to be a way to be aggressive while also having a way to blow up artifacts and enchantments. But the thing here is, I value it more for its aggression than it, the latter half. If I'm using it for the latter half, I want it right away, not ha not needing to have a bunch of other counters on top of it. So. I think it's a B. It's good in the right style of deck where, example, like you had mentioned, like, yeah, like if you have a bunch of counters to just throw around, sure, uh, it's probably pretty solid there. Um, but otherwise, this is just like I played in my humans deck because it grows and maybe along the way I get to blow up some artifacts and enchantments. Uh, but yeah, like, so I don't know. That feels like a, a strong B for me. I mean... Uh, if you play in your human deck, then you're rating it higher than most people on EDH rack. Like, I think that's why I think it's underrated is it's like Micaeus humans doesn't play it. Katilda doesn't play it. Leonor puts counters on things and it's human tribal and that doesn't play it. Like the fact that the okay. decks where it seems so good, people still most of the time don't play it. Like at least in True. those decks, it's got to be worth got to be worth jamming in those decks, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fully. I agree that it is worth jamming in those decks. How often do you activate it? Oh, uh, oftentimes, I guess the activating part in my humans deck, I find that more often than not, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I just I just want to keep the aggression like, you know, uh, the be as they do say, player removal is the best <laughs> removal. <laughs> and so like your artifacts and enchantments aren't there if you're dead. So <laughs> sure. I, I, I like it, but I think it's it's basically has to be a B. I wouldn't rate it higher than that because I want to put it in a deck that has lots of counters in it. Like, uh, I've seen it in Torrens most most often because, you know, Torrens is usually like a human tribal deck or at least creature heavy and poops out uh, tokens that have training, just like mm -hmm. Hopeful Initiate itself. So you can get a lot of counters very easily. Hams is another one that's like counters matters. So anything that, that generally makes a lot of plus one plus one counters uh, is going to be really good because you do need that fuel for it. The other thing that I don't like about it too much is three mana is a lot. To, to keep up at any given time i like i like it mostly as basically like a threat on the table like i will not blow up your thing if you you know don't attack me or whatever and then yeah. you don't need to spend the counters nor do you have nor do you have to spend the mana to do anything with it and you can use it kind of like as a rattlesnake mm -hmm. um I, I like it but like yeah i would only put it in a plus one plus one counter deck which is like not most of my decks so that's why i just put it as a b <laughs> I think it's, I'm going to stick it in A. I think it's still, I think it's more flexible. I think people underestimate cards that are popular in standard for commander. I think people see cards that people play in standard decks and they're like, oh, that's a standard card, not a commander yeah. card. And then people don't think through what they might be able to do in commander. So I think our I agree overall with average. That sentiment. Yeah. yeah isn't that something that, that happens? Yeah. 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 yeah when you I saw it like, on this list, I thought these I cards played. started somewhere. You all yeah. got to understand that. <laughs> yeah, when I when I saw the name name on this list, I had to Google it to see like, wait, that's the standard card, right? <laughs> yeah. There's something about cards in standard that just don't look right in Commander. I guess I can't really describe why exactly. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, overall, overall average of a B, and I, I wouldn't complain about that. I got it ranked a little bit higher than everyone else, but I, I think it's at least a B and uh, maybe a high B for me, or maybe even an A. Okay. All right. So we're going to consensus wise, put it as a B definitely underrated. Something you should consider more often, especially if you're in a, like a, a more aggressive deck, a plus one plus one counter deck. Like this is not something that you should look over just because it was in standard. Um, yeah. All right. We'll move on to Krim. What is your first pick? Well, you know, I guess I'm going to be talking about a few white one drops this week. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess I got to be Richard. Uh, okay, so one of the all-time, like, you know, greats, or I would say, like, from the start of Commander, 
was Sarah Ascendant. This card is a one mana, uh, and it's just one white mana, and it gets plus five plus five if your health is above like thirty, right? Yeah, yeah. It, if it's above thirty. Uh, so it's a six six with life link, and in Commander, as you know, you start at forty. So it was like a powerhouse of a one drop, but like in the current year, the reason why this is on my tier list and why I want to talk about it is not because I think it's still busted, but I think that it's fallen quite quite a bit since it's in, like since the starting days of when this card was an all star. I it is great. It's aggressive in humans. I love it, but like. I think that outside of that, like this card just isn't an auto include anymore. I used to see it as an auto include if you're playing white, because uh, it was just a good way to play and be aggressive, uh, assuming that like white a and you needed creatures, right? And especially in mono white, but in mono white in the current year, I may not even play it anymore. Uh, it it's a it's a good card. It's still a good card, but it's not the card. Uh, I I don't know. It's just a vanilla six six. Which uh, flying, that sounds what? it's a it's a yeah, six yeah. six it's flying, flying, flying life actually yeah, yeah. for one I don't mana? think this is what it once was to me what? I see it as a vanilla blank card like it's what? it's cool I'm I think sorry. it's very I... vanilla and boring but my god if you put this on the battlefield on turn one you are so likely to be ahead it, significant I mean, like, maybe <laughs> cards people wanted Vand I remember yeah. at least in yep. my play groups like when yep. when I started playing people were like this card is unfair. It needs to get banned. Blah, I mean, it blah. is a like, mistake. I don't think it needs. I don't think it, it needs to be banned, but it's like, it's, yeah. I mean, it's it's weird that it doesn't. It's it, like automatically turned on. Yeah, in commander, which it, is a little bit awkward, but it made wizards good. change the wording on that mechanic yeah. in future cards, where now it's like your life total has to be X above your starting life yes. total, like specifically because yeah. of how this card interacted with commander and the wording on it. I'm kind of with Krim though, like. If I had to choose, I used to think this was, like, a busted card in Commander and, like, would groan anytime someone played it on turn one. But it is just a big creature that gains you life. If I had to choose, I would a hundred times over rather drop a Esper Sentinel on turn one yeah. than drop a Sarah Send it in 2022 yeah. Magic. Like, I want something that's going to generate value, not something that's just going to be big and die and make me the arch enemy for the rest of the game. Because everyone's going to be pissed off that I played a 6-6 six, six Life Linker on turn one. Even once it dies, they're still going to be like, oh, remember turn one, you played that Sarah Send and I'm coming after you. I yeah, I <laughs> feel like people under underestimate just having a big beater on the battlefield, and how much how much politicking you, you get out of it, how much leverage because people are like, oh, I don't want to get hit by that six six. I'll do anything. I won't blow up your your X Y Z. I won't attack you back. I won't blah 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 blah. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'll take all these things. Sometimes you just have I, to embrace being the problem. What happens? I to mean, that? being being the problem is fine. <laughs> like, trust <laughs> me on that. That's never the concern. I think that this just isn't enough of a problem. Oh my god! Like, like I, that's what I mean. Like, it's still a decent card. Like, I love it in some decks, but it's just not the threat it once was. Wait, so you discarding the downside of at some point later in the game you drop this as a one mana one one life link. Yeah, but if uh, would you not play a one mana six six life link flying and say that this is absurd? I, I, don't I mean, I don't absurd. play the card. Wow. I, mean, I, I usually don't play it because it's so boring, but it's, hear, hear it, me out. it is pretty brutal. Um, I mean, I am like, thinking on turn one solid. or two, but still. I mean, like, yeah, on, on turn one and two, like, it's, it's like, that is at its best. And at its best, it still just feels solid. But not like, oh my god, like Soul Ring actually more threatening to me. As yes. for Sentinel, better in value, right? Like, like there's, sure. there's, mm -hmm. there's so much that I think that, like, I, I may, maybe because I I the, just just take take a step back and think about this. In the current year, everything does something else that accrues value. Do you get this not beating, true? Beating beating people is I don't I feel like it's just not enough anymore. Winning I, the I, game isn't enough. I don't, know. I, don't, I don't think it is. Like because it doesn't win you the game. I, I don't think it wins you the game anymore. It wins you the game more than a. Soul Ring or a Esper Sentinel, uh, but by itself, by itself, I mean, it does. Sure, <laughs> like I, like Soul Ring won't hit you directly, but it's gonna cause much sure. more damage. Yeah, yeah. But Esper Sentinel getting you more value means that, like, honestly, people I, people are already willing to just take eight off Sylvan Library. 
<laughs> like, like just right away, right? Like so, there is no shortage of ways to die in Commander, right? Like you know, what's like a good the, way of offsetting all that eight you're losing from Sylvan Library, though. Your Sarah is gaining six sure. each yeah. turn. Sure, but like that's what it is, right? That's just like oh, cool. Is and, like you. I don't know. I don't think it's enough. I don't think it's enough anymore. So it's, just uh, for the group rating, yes, yeah. I will, yeah uh, I want to. I have it at, at A. Uh, Seth, Seth and Krim have it at B. And Toma has it at A. So it is an A. A minus, I guess. B plus somewhere, mm-hmm. uh, maybe somewhere in that range. <laughs> I think where, where, it, where it used to be would be like S. Like, you know, oh, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. So that's what I mean. Like, I don't think it's a bad card. I just don't think it's the house that it once was. So uh, sure. this was held in high regard, and I feel like it's fallen down for me a little bit. So if I can go to bat for it for a moment. I think at minimum it's a B because mm-hmm. I think it's still a staple in life gain decks because oh, there's going to be a lot of there's a lot of life gain triggers that say if you gain four or more life this turn you like make a four four angel or if you gain life you can uh, pay X like uh, a well of lost dreams you can pay X and draw that many cards so drawing gaining six life in a turn it, it very efficiently is like really good and then. I would also say it's particularly strong in white in general because white has a lot of uh, one-drop synergies, um, such as Ranger Captain of Eos and Ranger of Eos. Both can get one-drops, tutor one-drops very efficiently into your hands. Um, so that's another way of making sure you get it early on in the game when it's really relevant. The downside... Wow. Well, okay, so I, I still value... <laughs> I, I highly value a one-drop 6-6 six, six flyer life. Like I think that's still very, very good even in 2022. So that's why I value it high. I think it's even better in lifelink decks. But even outside of lifelink decks, I think yet yeah, like if you get it, if I if you get it early, if it's a six six flyer for uh, six six flyer lifelink for one, I think this card is phenomenal. Sometimes it's not going to be if you're like get a late game and you're low on life and you're not in a life game deck. However, I think even then. I would say it's still uh, worth the risk because, like, a lot of these one drops that we all value kind of high, like a mana dork, like a Birds of Paradise, for example, is not very good on turn eight or so, you know? Just like a Sarah Ascendant sometimes being a 1 1, a lifelink that you top deck on turn eight uh, is not very good. Same thing. I mean, sometimes you just I, gotta... I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I would uh, value a Stitcher Supplier, right? I would value, like, a Hedron Crab in the right deck. I don't mind those on turn eight. I think I feel the like the crab on turn eight. What, what are you talking about? I, yeah. I rank that a D, by the way. The, that's uh, oh, crap. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, Hedron Crab's right, horrible. Uh, I, 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 I was gonna support Krim in this argument until he brought up the he, the Hedron Crab, <laughs> and I'm slowly backing through the <laughs> through Grave the brush. Crawler, um, the Eve's Guild Enforcer. The oh, yeah, good one. one drops. Yeah, here's These my, are all still great turn eight. Why are here's, why are you so down on six six? Here's, why are here's, here's yeah, that's kind all of right. So here's here's like. Here's my argument, Tomer. I, I think there's there's two things that it, the, in response to what you said. One is I feel like out of every card on our list, this just immediately makes you the arch enemy more than any other card. Like uh, Lano or Elves, Birds of Paradise, whatever, Mother of Runes, you can kind of fly under the radar. People might be like, oh, that's a good one drop. But like this is like, boom, deal with me, kill me, attack me more than any other card. So I don't like that aspect of it. The other thing is it doesn't generate any any repeated value for the long game. Llanowar Elves gets you to your nice. stuff faster. Uh, some of these cards life. draw you cards. Ragavan's making you treasures. Like, all it this is doing... people. Like, it, well, but what does it? Or does it hit yeah. people for, like, 12 or 18, and then someone kills it, and everyone's like, oh, Tomer's at 60 life. You yeah, better yeah. take him out. Like, I, it doesn't do anything. It's not filling your graveyard like a Stitcher Supply or doing anything that's going to, like, generate that repeated value for the long game. So I still love it in life gain decks. I think it's a staple of life gain decks, but sure, yeah. it's not the era anymore for me where it's like, oh, I have white mana. I might as well just jam it because this is going to be it's going to be a 6-6 six, six flying lifelinker on turn one. Like, that doesn't impress me in 2022. I think Sadly, if, if, yeah. I think if you become the arch enemy after the Sarah Ascendant is dead... Then this this is just more credit to the Sarah Sun being that good. Like you 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 think it's that that strong. 
that you're willing to take out the person after the Sarah Senate is dead, then that I think that's confirmation that this card is it's, like it's, broke, like busted for one for one mana. It's like the opposite of the Richard strategy. Like you know the like <laughs> lay back, play my spirited companions, look really weak until I sneak in and steal the win, and Richard beats us like yeah. every other game he plays. This is like the direct opposite of that. It's like boom, the biggest baddest thing on turn one. Like come at me, bro. And I mean valid, I don't know. but I also played Slicer, and I was the problem on turn three or so. And, and then we took you out eventually because you you dealt like 40, 60 damage to all of us, and then we took you out because we didn't like your slicer. Like I think I that's how a, that. I had ended. a great time though. I was, <laughs> okay. I, I, I'll do that again every single time. Honestly, like I'm okay you with that. You were also insanely mana screwed. If you could have, you, you stole one of my lands. Yeah, yes. that was that was your fault. <laughs> <I didn't. laughs> it was quite a yeah. I don't know. I, yeah, the yeah. Richard strategy is fine. Like, if you don't want to have a target on your back, but I, you know what? If you get a target on your back, you better have something to back it up, like a six-six six flying life linker. Yeah, I, that's what I was. What, what are you gonna do? You're gonna attack me? I'll hit it's you harder. Just a six-six right. life linker. I, 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 I want to know what. Yeah, I want to know, know what the YouTube's think. If yeah. you're somebody's reading comment, let me know because I'm very curious what other people think. Maybe about I'm the this only one. person who values just hitting people hard. I don't know. <laughs> I, I value hitting people hard. This is this is the like it's it's just it's not okay. hard enough. All right, fair enough. All right, we'll move on for the sake of covering all the cards. Uh, Phil, what's your first uh, candidate for one of the um, one drops? Mine is of course uh, probably the most essential one drop creatures in Commander. One mana value mana dogs, and that includes Birds of Paradise, uh, Findon elves. Lanoa elves, all these one mana tap for one. Uh, they are amazing. They get we you do, to your th three we drops. We do have. Uh, sorry, we just we we do have different uh, uh, categories for it though. Just uh, oh yeah, we do have uh, some different. So one mana, one yeah, just tap for mana. We also have like uh, you could say death right shaman, but I. So, I, we did not say right, yeah, so Noble quick, Hierarch and Ignoble Hierarch are not on this list. But otherwise it's Lanoa Elves, Birds of Paradise. Oh, Birds of Paradise is down here. Yeah, I guess they're, we split they're them all up kind as well. of spread around. Ignoble Okay, so here's quick rundown. Lanoa Elf style, mana dorks. Phil gave it an A, everyone else gave it a B. Birds of Paradise, everyone gave it an A, except I, I think Krim I just bumped it just up to an S it. as I was reading that. Uh Noble, Ignoble Hierarch. A for Phil, A for me, A for Tomer, B from Krim, and then the last one way down at the bottom, Arbor Elf, uh, B from Phil, A from me, Bs and Bs. So everyone ranks them B or higher, and then I think Birds of Paradise would be number one as far as our rankings with a consensus A, and then the rest of them are kind of in the like low A's, high B range as far as consensus rating. So, uh, yeah, sorry, Phil, I didn't Paradise and Noble and Ignorable High Arc and then, like, Arbor Elves. Elves, Elves yeah. And, yeah. So, sorry, Phil, Wait. I didn't mean to interrupt you. They're all scattered yeah. around our list. So, sure, yeah, I, I didn't go, go see ahead. this in this. Yeah, okay. Uh, how is Lano Elves a B? It, so, isn't it? I don't really like creature ramp i feel like remember last podcast where we talked about artifact ramp maybe being like a scam because it gets blown up <laughs> Did, I, well, I don't necessarily buy that argument for artifacts oh boy do i buy it when it comes to creatures because i play against yeah. crim all the time and crim's a big believer in playing 10 wraths in every deck that he plays so I, so i put them as a b i like them in decks that synergize with them like elves they're great or edric it really works with the plan of the deck but if i'm just playing like a generic green deck i tend to play zero mana dorks in all rampant growth nature's lore style ramp effects what about if you have like a three drop commander would you not want to run one drop that would be to get them if you're playing grist or something yeah if you're playing grist or something where you have a specific reason to go from one to three i think that goes up in value um well, Otherwise, Don't most decks have like like is that's the value I think in in uh, uh the, these one drops. Green has so many threes. Some of those being cultivate, which kind of like cements your your ramp and in all of that like even harder. And you get it to a you get to it a turn earlier. So I I mean I don't know. I I still think that these mana dorks have a place in your deck. 
I don't know if you're playing like 50 of them unless you're an elf deck, but like, I don't know, right? Like, is, isn't, isn't that why mana dorks are amazing? It helps green, green, black. There's just so many things at three mana. Uh, that's why I, I value like, okay, land of worlds is just a B to me. Uh, but that's because I think birds of paradise is like S tier, right? Birds of paradise is a mana dork. I would play in a deck that has green in a five color deck in a, it, like, like we're, we're talking like, this is the, the go-to mana dork for me. Um, it just adds whatever color it p- plays well with any deck. Uh, maybe not in elves because it itself isn't an elf and elves ha- don't need the, the multicolor aspect of it. But otherwise birds of paradise, I think is like the truth. And then Death Rite Shaman is more than just a mana dork. It can kind of be a mana dork, but I look at it more as graveyard hate and a way to like it, like the with with the upside of potentially being more uh, to like add additional mana. But I can eat spells out of your graveyard. I can like I don't know. It's just something that I can slowly just chip away at everyone's graveyard with. Oh, we didn't even mention the ranking for Death Rite Shaman, but Death Rite oh, yeah. Shaman we have uh, Seth is a B. Or no, sorry. Phil is a B. Seth and Krim are have it at S, and I have it as A. Oh, if, so if it's oh wow, it's <laughs> if Death Rite's in here, then yeah, that's the that is the best mana dork. That's better than Birds of Paradise, I think. Like, what? I have I a caveat on that so. one. We always say you should play yeah, more Graveyard like Hate. It. We always say you should play more yeah, Graveyard Hate. Like and this rap. is a mana dork that also yeah. gives you Graveyard it, Hate. Why it's not a mana dork. Like it? It, it's not a, it, it doesn't function as a mana dork on turn one. You can't rely. It does. That's it does if theme. you play a lot of fetches. But you, so. you could you could only run maximum oh. what ten like 10, maybe 12, twelve or twelve. Well, it how, triggers how on your opponent's it? fetches too, though. Yeah, it, yeah, but what if you just don't what have a meta don't? with a lot of fetches? I I will I will admit that it does depend a little bit on the budget of your deck. If you're playing fifty dollar decks in your play sucks. group and no one is no one is playing like the high tier fetch lands, then it's an actively bad card. But if you're playing like relatively expensive high, like our commander clash pay play group, the, the amount of fetches that we have, I think it's the best mana dork in the, in the meta that we have on commander clash. It, because it also does more than yeah. just be a mana dork. Right. So that's yeah, also it why also I have less. it in S. It that's could true. There be. is consistent. Maybe I should it put is. it at A. I never try to play it because I always think like, oh, I play this on turn one and then I wait until turn four until I finally found the yeah. fetch. It's an uh, amazing card, but like, I don't know. It really depends on your play group. Like if you yeah. just don't, if you're in a play group where you can't consistently tap it for mana, I don't think it's very good. I, I to, would agree with that. You need to run like 12, like you need to run all the fetches that you can basically. <laughs> If you're not running any fetch lands in your deck, like would you run this? Would you run this card? I mean, it's still just good. Like the, I think the the nice thing about it is that it's graveyard hate and uh, potentially a mana dork, right? So and its potential is why I rank it high, right? Like I can, it does a little bit of everything. It doesn't excel in one thing. It's just good at a, a multi, like a jack of all trades kind of thing. So I think I still like it. If it just sat there as a way to eat your graveyard. I don't hate it. Along the way, if it adds mana, great. It's a good one drop. I I think it's just uh, a good one drop. I think you got to be like 50% flow. Like, if this is rarely making any mana, then I think it's bad. Like, if I have to be playing in a group where I'll accept sometimes where like, oh, things went wrong. There's no fetch lane. I don't get mana. Uh, But I have to be in a play group where this is usually more than half the time, probably like 75% of the time, like making me mana for me to be excited about it. If I'm playing like all pre-con decks and there's like zero fetch lands and everyone's playing scry lands and gain lands, I I wouldn't. I don't think it's good enough as just graveyard hate. I think you need to mostly be making mana, but then also. But yeah, but that's just myriad. If you're doing the land, if that's it though, and everyone has two fetch lands because they have evolving wilds and blighted woodlands or something, for me then it wouldn't be worth it in that type of meta. But if everyone's playing like five or ten fetch lands and that's forty going around the table. Then it's like pretty consistent at fixing your mana, and you get the upside of fizzling reanimation, fizzling an eternal witness, or just incidentally gaining life if you end up, you know, low at the table. Like, I like cards that incidentally gain life. So I think Tomer, I would agree See, with Tomer that it's dependent on your play group, but I think its ceiling is like the highest out of all the mana dorks in a high powered, like, non budget style play group. It's and of course, really in CDH, it's an all star, yeah. but we're not, sure. we're not uh, accounting for that. But like, oh. like, how about I, Gilded Goose? It also gains life, and it 
I no. mean, Death Watch you gotta, sometimes you gotta sink one, mana. So. Yeah, yeah, I'm just asking the if question. If you're yeah, spend you mana to make it. mana, no, thank you. If you can yeah, make food, yeah. I think it's fine. You can if do you're, it once. If you're a deck that can make food, I think it's pretty good. Yeah. But if you're like, play it, make a mana, spend two mana to make a food, make a mana the next turn, like, I think it's just yeah. a little it, too oh, slow. Just, but if you have like tireless, whatever that like food tireless tracker thing is. Like Probably something sure. like that. That's no, but you could just make treasure with that. Yeah, you could just make treasure that. <laughs> but that's makes cool. mana as well. No, I you was just, just thinking it, it sounded like. So you described it like, oh yeah, sometimes you only make one or two mana with it, and oh, you can also incidentally gain life with it. That's just Gilded Goose, and I wouldn't rate Gilded Goose as one of the best one drops. And yeah. Deathrite Shaman kind of sounded like a Gilded Goose. But <laughs> yeah. Deathrite can gain you life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I on know. top of I that, just... it is it is graveyard hate. I look yeah. at it as it graveyard hate first, at and speed. then yeah, at instant speed. I look at it gra as graveyard hate first. That could make me mana. That could maybe gain me life, and therefore I think it is just a very good one drop. Oh yeah, I I rate like, it below it, like, like birds. Not, not this, so it is. this is this is the original. Uh, this was the the pioneer of one drop planeswalkers. If, if yeah, there ever is, is one, it's also I, I, I should also say that it's very good in in mill decks. I like oh, yeah. if you can Ooh. if you do a self mill like self Cities, mill yeah. Brew tyrant, then you'll consistently have stuff and you don't even need fetch lands in that regard. I mean fetch lands are always better, but uh, and also if you're milling your opponents. And this is a great way of stopping any of their recursion. So you can just mill them without, with, with having backup there as well. So I think it gets a lot better in there too. I, since we're talking one mana mana dorks, I got to shout out Arbor Elf, which I think is just better than the Llanowar Elf tier. Like if I want to play a Llanowar Elf effect, Arbor Elf is usually the one I go to first because it often makes multiple colors of mana because you can untap dual lands, you can untap triomes. And you get this upside where if you can have like a Utopia Sprawl or something else that enchants a land, it can lead to some really explosive plays if you're untapping a land that taps for multiple mana. And that got even easier now that we have Yavmaya, which technically turns your Cabal Coffers or turns your Nykthos or whatever into a forest. So I think that I think that's the best of the like mono green one color mana dorks personally. That's my favorite. That's a good point. I just forgot about this. <laughs> yeah. You slap a uh, wild growth or utopial sprawl Ooh. on that. Yeah, you or can like, have some very explosive yeah. plays. You put Yavamaya and Gr Gaius Cradle on the battlefield and live the dream. Yeah, if Tomer so, had banned us from playing Cradle, Tomer. Because it's a stupid <laughs> card. <laughs> Wait, okay, fine. You unban Cradle and let me play Edric again. How about oh, that? No. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll keep Cradle banned. You, it's you fine. Can. <laughs> Wait, the, it's not on the ban list. No, yeah, it's but not anymore. You will be the band. enemy. <laughs> I've been soft banned since the very first Commander Clash. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I saw that episode. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun, though. Um, I guess on the topic, uh, I to, to respond to Seth's uh, thing about not running Manadors because I'll die to removal, I still will, like, I agree to that to an extent. Like, if you're in green, you have other ramp options, but I think there's a lot of reasons why you still want to be running Manadors. The first one is, again, like uh, we mentioned earlier, if you have a three-drop commander and your deck is built around having that, that commander on the battlefield, then these mana dorks can help you get it out on turn two. And that mm -hmm. will let you, you know, start getting your value engine on the battlefield and doing that stuff. So that's one one reason I'd, I'd run them. Uh, the second reason, though, is if you have a very heavy creature synergy deck, then I think it's still worth running mana dorks. For example, if you're running the Great Henge or Beast Whisper yeah. or Guardian Project, stuff that says like you draw a card whenever you cast a creature, or you just have stuff that are keyed off your creatures, like you know, Crater Hoofs and whatnot, um, then then the synergies offset the downside of mana dorks. So that yes, they will die eventually to an incidental board wipe or whatever, but it doesn't matter because your top deck, you know, Finhorn Elf or whatever, is going to be that much better than a Rampant Growth because your Rampant Growth later on is not going to be that interesting, but your Finhorn Elf is still going to draw you a card. It's still going to do whatever else your creature synergy deck wants to do. And there's a lot of green decks that are creature focused decks so i think they get a lot better if you have the rest of your deck working with creature synergies and then of course if you're elf ball obviously that's probably the the fact like the default biggest most popular creature synergy deck out there because greens are uh, elves are super popular and half these mana dorks are elves anywhere or more than half 
Um, so I think that they, I, there's reasons to be not not worry about the offset of them dying. I think the takeaway might be the same as our last cast, which boom, here's your here's your segue, Tomer. You can pop up a card somewhere. But uh, yeah. <laughs> when we did the Manorag thing, the takeaway was think through your ramp. And I think that's kind of what you were saying there. I would agree there are some decks that really want mana dorks. But if you're not playing a deck that has those synergies, you're probably better off playing land ramp so it's not going to get blown up. So as you're building your deck, like think through like how many great henges, how many tribal synergies or creature synergies do I have for these creatures? Or if you don't have any of those or you have landfall synergies or something, then the mana dorks become actively bad and you really want to have the, the rampant growth style effect. So just avoid falling into that, the, that repetitive mindset where you just play the same cards every time, I think, is probably the big takeaway. Again, two weeks in a row. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is the most, <clears throat> like, that's commander, right? You build around your commander and try to make the synergies work. Like, in Lornis, I value one-drop creatures that produce mana over rampant growths, obviously. And then in mm -hmm. Omnath, it's the other way around. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I think. So I guess, are we at a B then? If we were going to sum this all up, all the mana dorks, is B the no, the average grade no, of all the no, mana dorks? It's gotta be A though. No. I, I I think that they they're still too strong, right? Like when you think of like like staples in certain colors, I think of the mana dorks heavily, uh, like in in green because green has so many. And yes, I know other colors have sort of mana dork stuff, but like green just has the best, right? When it comes to mana dorks, and when you're when you're trying when so many things start coming down on turn three and your game starts at turn three, having it a whole turn earlier before the rest of the table, I think mana dwarfs should serve too good of a, a like a, a purpose that like they fill the curve out and they're primarily the reason why I hate green, right? So like like Tell us how you this, really feel <laughs> Yeah, like it, like look, I under I hate it because I don't have it, right? So look, I you understand can't just play green. I understand. It's just there. Join us. No, no. You see, I, I, I appreciate what what they can do for the color, um, and that they they help you just essentially get to the game plan and setup way earlier, and that is huge in a multiplayer game because you will have the ability to fight back against whatever people are trying to do against you. That's true. I, I so I think just to to move on from it to get the rating on the board. I'm just gonna throw the the like the green only elves mana dorks at B, and then we're gonna just shove the other ones at A. And we'll call it a day. I know there's yeah. there's some grumbling, right. but it's close. consensus. We <laughs> yeah. gotta close, move on. We enough. have other close cards. En close enough. Yeah, close enough. Yay! Compromise. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm gonna move on to my first pick, and this is a card that I literally did not know existed <laughs> until. Until we, we got to this podcast and somebody put it on the sheet and I was like, oh my god, this card is actually like, holy moly. Uh, this so is uh, Haywire Might. It's a brand new card from Brothers War. It's a one colorless artifact creature insect. It's a 1-1 one, one, and when it dies, you gain two life and you can pay one green and sacrifice Haywire Might to exile target non-creature artifact or non-creature enchantment. So essentially for two mana total, a two mana uh, total amounts of mana, uh, you exile a non-creature artifact or non-creature enchantment. So somebody's Rhystic Study, exiled. You can't get it back from the graveyard, gone for good. Uh, somebody's Smothering Tithe, exiled, gone for good. It doesn't hit creatures. So if there's any problematic creature artifact or creature enchantment, you're going to have to find a different way of dealing with it. But I don't know, this attached to a body... Seems really good. Like, one mana, put it on the battlefield. It's easily recurrable. It's easily found. Like, it's a one-drop, so you can find, like, with Ranger of Eos and everything. You can easily get it back from the graveyard with a thousand and one different artifact, you know, a reanimation thingies. Like, Scrap Trawler will always get it back if you get, like, two or less. Uh, or, like, Mirror Retriever, Sun Titan gets it back. You know, like, it seems, like, really good. What's this like, is this, like, really good? so good. Yeah, this card. This card is absurd. I th this card is an S for me, just because. I mean, it, it. If you play green, you should play this. It is recurrable. It's a super caustic caterpillar. It does. It exiles and it gains you life on top of that. And because it's a creature, it's easily because where it comes in on the uh, the curve of one mana, you can easily just like green sun zenith. Oh no, you can't. But you can go and get like a cord, right? 
you yep. can do something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, this this card is just it's so efficient and it's so juiced up. There's yep. just no reason for you not to play this if you have green mana. So it's I, A's for me and Phil and S's from for Seth and, and Krim, by the way. Sorry, guys. I was I was also gonna say I have it as S. For me, it's like an A tier card, but I'm like the biggest believer in Urza Saga that you should play it in most <laughs> mm-hmm. decks. And especially in our playgroup where we have Soul Ring Band, we just had a conversation about this actually, about like, oh, without Soul Ring, do you have enough good targets? For me, this is, if you have green, this is a great addition to your deck because it works like kind of a Rex Age or whatever, where you can use it fairly, but then this is also something you can tutor up with your Urza Saga to like kind of uh, build out that package a little bit more. So that's what for me bumped it up to an S here. The only other thing I had on this was, I know it says non-creature artifact or enchantment, but when you think about Commander, like, it is going to be pretty unlikely that that matters. Like, pretty much every enchantment you want to blow up, and most of the artifacts you want to blow up are going to be non-creatures anyway. Like, I guess some once in a while you might hit a worm coil or something that's a problem, yeah. or maybe you need to get rid of a solemn, but it's the great hand, just Mirari's Wake, it's Smothering Tide, it's Ristic Study. Like, those are the things that you want to be answering, and it does it so efficiently, and you even get to gain life. So, I yeah, I think this card is just... It's a new, like, auto-include level card, I think, for me, as far as my green decks. Yeah, I was yeah. going to ask, like, are are there, do you think the non-creature restriction is going to be very annoying when you no. play it in Commander? You'll you'll run into certain decks. Like, you run into new Commander Precon Urza or something, or you run into Hopagura, or, like, these weird fringe decks that are built around artifact creatures, and it might be a problem. But in a in a random pod, I think that this hits almost everything that you want to. Like, the, I am not worried about that even a little bit as far as this, like, dropping its playability or anything because most of the stuff you want to blow up isn't a creature anyway. Yeah. And it doesn't yeah. just blow it up because it Shadow Realms it. It just full-on exiles <laughs> yeah. it, right? Like, yeah, that's... I, I love that. It is the when nightmare it was... for Cauldra. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no! Uh, when it got spoiled, I was kind of shocked about that wording that it just sacrifices itself we've seen effects like this but then you have to exile it yeah. so you can't recur it that easily this one is just very easy to get out of there again like it's an artifact these are probably the easiest permanent to return from the graveyard maybe creature but yeah it's both so yeah uh i'm probably not gonna find room in my decks for it since it's like it's kind of boring bonus. but it is yeah i know but it i it's do play rex sage and i do play the the druid of purification so that's enough I, right uh, i need more card draw i, I feel like this <laughs> is better than rex sage like unless you're yeah. it, it elves is. and you oh, specifically yeah. can benefit from the creature yeah. type on rex sage i think i would just yeah, play I, this in a generic green deck over rex sage yeah, yeah I I, I, this part is absurd some ETB triggers. If you're like Blink or Elves, yeah. 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 If you have, if you have those synergies, stuff. yeah. But but if you don't have Blink synergies, and even better, if you have like Sacrifice synergies, this card's Ooh. really good. Yeah. So yeah, That's if, I, yeah, if you if you like say. me, I can't keep up with all the new cards that are coming <laughs> out. Uh, Haywire might. It's an uncommon. It's less than a dollar. Uh, consider it. <laughs> we all rate it pretty highly. Are we going to shove it, what, on S? Is that going to be our first S or A plus? I, I, would, I would argue I'd, for I S. If you go S, to A, yeah. that's fine. We're split right in the middle. It's a S minus, so, a, a plus, somewhere in there. I'll leave it to you, Phil. Where would you put this? Do you think it's... I mean, I'd put it at A. <laughs> so oh, yeah, I guess true. it's... Whatever. I, if editor Tomer will figure out where to put it. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. The consensus did say S, so I'm just going to bump it up. You know what? Whatever. I mean, right. we caught um, it and also include in every deck, so I guess it's an S. Okay. I wouldn't, but <laughs> I make my own decisions. <laughs> yes. yes. All right. We'll move on. Seth, what's number two for us? I got, I got another underrated one drop here that every time I see it show up in a game of Commander, it overperforms and does really well, but I don't see people play it very often. And that card is Uvenwald Tracker. It is a one mana, one, one human shaman that has an ability where you can pay to and tap it and make target creature you control fight another target creature. So rating wise, I have it as an A 
Everyone else has it as a B. Maybe I went a little bit too high on that. But I think this card, I've seen this show up a few times on Commander Clash. Not super recently, but I've remembered games where it kind of just dominates the board and is like the biggest conversation at the table. What are we going to do about this? Oh, no, it's just locking my creatures out of the game. Yeah, you got to have other creatures. It's not going to fight well by itself. It's just a 1-1. One, one. But you're a green deck, and green is known for its huge creatures, bigger than everything else at the table a lot of times. So this can just be repeatable two mana shoot down anything and it doesn't even have a timing restriction you can do this at instant speed you can wait until uh, the end step before your turn see what everyone else plays and then fight down whatever you need to fight down so i think that this card probably deserves a little bit a little bit more credit it's one of those cards that maybe people have just forgotten about but obviously good if you have fight synergies if you're playing nihilith or something like that really good with like ronas because it's indestructible and death touching oh, yeah. but even in just any deck with a bunch of big green creatures. I think this should be in the conversation in one of your removal slots because green just its removal has improved, but most of its removal is fight based anyway. And being repeatable and instant speed once you untap with this, I think is a nice upside in your removal uh, package. I mean, I mean go ahead. <laughs> you gotta have a big creature though. Like, you do. I. Or a little death I, here, but... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I can't imagine a deck where I would play this that I played recently. I, I don't know. It's probably not good in some, Phil deck. Some big you, ones. Phil, okay, I got you, Phil. <laughs> Phil doesn't you play big creatures. You play in Thievery someone else's big creature oh. and then fight <laughs> fight with this. Yeah, that's the Phil way. Sure. <laughs> I I will run it in every green stompy deck. Like, I put it in Werewolves. Yeah, that's, that seems good, yeah. Yeah, I put it in Xenagos. I put it in, like, yeah, just a bunch. Just a bunch of, like, anything that has big creatures. Bigger than my opponent's creatures, essentially. Because if you have, like, a bunch of utility creatures... They're not fighting anything. But, like, I don't know. It's not too hard to find, like, a green stompy deck and you just shove this in there and get some good value. Like, instant speed uh, removal that's repeatable is very good for a one drop. Um, and a little bit of a Instant speed is pretty good. Then. Yeah. yeah. And two mana is very reasonable for it. <laughs> it's also, like, pretty good in what green is trying to do, right? Considering that green is big bodies. And counter spells and draw and, and everything else too, uh, but like on top <laughs> of that, like, like, like uh, <laughs> I I I think that it's exactly what you want in a, a green deck, right? And it's the best way to have removal attached to like a creature strategy. I I, I like it. That's Plus, I don't best tracker. Plus, you get the creature synergy. Green's pretty good at finding creatures. So it's a removal spell that you can green sun zenith or court of calling or any of those type of worldly tutor if you need to, and it's a one drop that unlike most one drops, gets better as the game goes along. In the late game, it's more likely you're going to have a big creature and more likely that your opponent's going to have something worth killing. So it's a one drop that on turn one is like kind of meh, but if you draw it off the top on turn six or seven, it's actually like kind of a pretty good draw for a one drop. Yeah, it's not yeah. a bad top deck. Wait, do you have to tap it to make stuff You fun? do. It, it, okay. Yeah, so it does Ooh, have otherwise. to not be summoning sick, Ooh. yeah. Feels totally off on it now. <laughs> no, I just I'm just confused because it's a tracker that doesn't generate a lot of value. I guess. Yes. <laughs> oh god. Tracker tribal Phil. Tracker doesn't tribal. make any clues. Get what am I doing yeah. with this? Nah. What is this? Killing things. Oh. <laughs> All right. I mean, not much to say. Like, if you are in Stompy, it's it's very good. I I do think it's a little bit underrated in terms of like underplayed. Like, yeah, I think this card is very, very good, and if you're if you're in a stompy deck, you absolutely should be considering it. And uh, I know I gave it an A, but everyone else gave it Bs. That gives it a an overall ranking of a B, and I I won't complain about that. And maybe I overrated a little bit today, honestly. But I did want to mention it because I think it probably should see a little more play than it does. Another one that's like two percent of decks on EDH rec or something, so it just doesn't see that much play anymore. Two percent of all green decks. Yeah, that seems a lot for this much of a. Rest all green, like also five color decks and stuff, right? I think so anything would... that has green mana, yeah. I would love to see the stats for mono green decks because that's that and gruel decks. I think is where it shines. Get on that EDH track. We need better yeah. stats. <laughs> better stats. Yeah. Better breakdowns, please. <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll move on. Krim, what do you got number two for us? 
So for number two, as I had mentioned, I am going down the list of, of white one drops. And I think this one has held the list uh, over the, the test of time here. And I think it's Mother of Ruins. I think this card is still an S. I think this card is still good. It it does exactly what I want it to do, though it may not like be aggressive in itself. It protects some of my better value engines, uh, maybe like a Timna or something from removal. Who knows? Whatever whatever creature base thing I want to keep protected, including itself, this does that. It makes it so that a single spot removal spell isn't enough, right? So you got to get this. Truly makes it so the whole table has to band together, have two forms of removal. Or a sweeper, right? Which could force someone into who's holding a sweeper into just using it because they have to. So, I don't know. I, I think this card is still one of, if not the better, like the best one drops in white. This card is still solid in 2022. It's been as solid as, as it's always been. So, I still love this card. I think we have, what, A, rating-wise, A, A for me and Phil, S from Krim, B from Tomer. Tomer, why do you hate mom? <laughs> I don't hate mom. <laughs> All right, we're not going to have another, another wow. uh, <laughs> sick, kill, sick kill hospital uh, on our head. Uh, very What's pro, wrong with mom, dude? Very, very pro mom, so I'm sure this one's very, very nice, um, but... I don't know. I literally, I just don't play this card. Anytime I'm in like a white deck that might might benefit from this, I just don't run it. Like it gives, it taps, it gives protection for for one one color, and it can protect itself, which is really nice. So I appreciate the fact that you can have onboard protection from target removal, and it's a way of getting around potential blockers too. And it can make your own thing block something much bigger if it doesn't have trample, and that's fine. I get that, but honestly, if I really want this effect, I just like run Whisper Silk Cloak instead. Whisper Silk Cloak equipment, uh, quick creature gets shroud and unblockable. Like, but, if I but want shroud, that effect, doesn't that bite you in the butt sometimes? Nah. <laughs> like, like <laughs> specifically, maybe. someone who likes to equip things. What well, equipments are usually colorless, so it's fine. That's that's true. That's true. But shroud. Oh, oh, yeah, then, yeah. You have to, you have to put your equipment on first, and then right. silk cloak. I could, um, I could swear. Like, I feel like so many people I see fall prey to their own shroud effect, right? Yeah. So from boots. So I don't know. I mean, mom doesn't have to worry about that. Who but played I, mom I, I don't, recently? I think I, we saw it in a recent episode. She's definitely in, she's maybe, in Kalia yeah. Precon, so I think we saw it there. Maybe, oh, I played it. I played yeah. it. That was right. It was in the Kalia precon, and Ooh. Mom was just like, "Yeah, Kalia is." Oh sad. yeah. Like, uh, it's it. I didn't even know Mom was up for debate. I thought Mom was like just uh, gonna be a unanimous. I just mom don't is, run her. Like, I don't know. Like, I, every time I, I have a white deck, that yeah, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, maybe step Mom. Uh, like, I oh. can dis we can discuss there and what? giver of ruins, but what? but like. Like, Stepmom is pretty much the Modern Horizons counterpart, and that one you can only target another creature. Um, not your own. Or not, I mean, not your own. Uh, not it can't protect itself, but you can give protection from colorless, right? Is the one fringe yeah. upside. Yeah. And it has two yeah. toughness instead of one, so it's a slightly better, right. better block. Yeah, I mean, sure. <laughs> being able to protect yourself is a huge upside of Mother of Runes. I would say, like... Remember at the beginning of the cast when we talked about Sarah Senda and you talked about all the like one drops are really good in white, they can tutor them up really easily. I think that would be my argument for mom over like a Whisper Silk, uh, silk Cloak. Obviously, if you're playing an equipment deck or something, the equation changes, but it's a human, so it works with tribal synergies. It's a creature, so you can tutor it up pretty easily. And it is a pretty good form of protection, although. I do think Krim, a little over the top with the S because you do need stuff that's worth protecting. Like some decks you just, yeah, you know, you're playing a bunch of like generic tokens that are all the same. Like, what do you want to do with mom? Or if you're playing a control deck without many creatures, why do you even want a mom in your deck? So I think I do, can't give it an S just because of that. Yeah, you're a commander. Yeah. <laughs> I don't do cast you, my like, commander do you, anyway. Oh, well, then there <laughs> lies the problem, right? I don't, like, we've seen, like, Mother Runes play, like, maybe once in Commander Clash. I yeah, I like, never I, play her. I never I, see her. How is that? I feel I, like I, Richard I, plays it a lot. He just never draws I've, it. I've played her. Also, Richard plays her. Richard I mean, Pond yeah, I, I just, the games I do play, I just don't see her. 
Okay. Yeah. Oh. Full that's disclosure. Like, that's like mommy issues, I guess, in its own way. Right. Like, <laughs> like you know what I mean? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I I rated it as an A, but I would probably. Maybe now that I think about her, but I never play her. I just know that I can't deal with her, and I would be very frightened if she hits the boards with a good commander like Kalia. Like a worth protecting commander. Uh, yeah, it's more like a A out of fear and not because I play her myself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I need to see. I need to see y'all play Mother of Runes more before. You have. You I have. Mean, yeah. You played it, but only because the precon had had her. No, I, I mean you've seen me. If if I have the, you you played it with when we played the humans pods. Uh, yeah. you've or you've seen me play it like at, in Paper Commander. If I have, if I have a creature in the deck, I want this. So she can like. I don't know. I like the fact that you just have her sticking around and she blinks basically the first target removal. She dies to the or, first board wipe. combat. But or... if you use her in like combat, then you just open it up to somebody, you know, using the target removal. That. So it's like kind of like kind of very risky if you're trying to use it in combat as a protection from other creatures. A lot of times oh, you want to wait until you're like killing someone and then you go into that yeah. like, oh like yeah, if i sure. give this big thing protection yeah. i just get to kill you but a lot of times yeah. you leave it back on that's the funny thing about mom is a lot of times it just sits there and does nothing because you don't want to tap it and no one wants to yeah. target your stuff because you will tap it so a lot of times it just sits there for many many turns before you really use it but it's still kind of like doing its job because no one wants to target your stuff because they know you'll fizzle it and, and the protection doesn't guarantee getting through all blockers. It's only one color, right? So if you're right. against a multicolor deck, then it might not work. Well, if like, you're against a multicolor so deck, it's even better, right? Because then <laughs> you it? only have to name one color, and you know if their deck is multicolor, they probably like oh. if I can name like black, right? And yeah. and then okay, I know that majority of your stuff that matters is going to be in black and white. But for getting okay. through blockers, it can be a little. A little awkward. But in mono color deck, you can just hundred percent blank. I mean, it's a cool upside yeah. that you also hate all well, blank white cards. But don't stop colorless. They, like they have I like colorless sure. artifacts. Sure. sure, we're at least all in agreement that Mother Runes ranks ahead of Giver of Runes, right? Like that, yes. right. that right. much is true. Protecting okay. itself is very important. I'm, okay, well, we got double A and S. I gave it a B. I I still think it's good in particular decks. Like like Seth said, if you can, you know, if you're a human deck or whatever, it's a human. It can, if you can tutor it up with Ranger of Yas, whatever. So we're just gonna shove it into A. I don't know. I don't have anything else. Other than anything else I can say about it, other than I just don't write it. <laughs> it's still <laughs> the one of the top white one drops for me, and it still holds to this day. So I I I love this card. So yeah, it, I've got it in S. It goes into the A slot, and we'll just move on. Phil, what do you got for us? So sometimes I play these creatures, and whenever I have them on the battlefield, at some point somebody says, wait, is this card just good? And that is Soul Warden and <laughs> Essence Warden. Both one mana, one ones that gain one life whenever a creature enters the battlefield. Full stop. So even your opponent's creatures. I play it just for value in Lornis, and whenever it hits the battlefield, even if it's like turn six or something, so many decks just poop out a bunch of tokens or just one creature every turn. It just gains sometimes 10 life, sometimes 40, sometimes infinite. Uh, if I go infinite or my opponents do, that's also, it is infinite protection in a way. Sometimes your opponent tries to yeah, like uh, Kiki Jiki do combo some, doesn't, like, yeah, with Pastor Might or whatever doesn't work through oh, this. Or, or, it Deceiver would, though, X arc, it has yeah. more than one power, right? Dece so it's yeah, like a, Deceiver X arc is the one that doesn't work with it. Depends on the specific combo, but yeah, yeah. But that it's so just from Predate testing, it's usually very, very much alive for one mana. And it the only thing that might be a bit bad about them is it. it it is kind of threatening if whenever something happens, you say, oh, I gain one life, thank you. Especially in paper when you have to reach over to the life counter and tap it whenever anything hits the board. <laughs> Otherwise, I just think they're amazing value for one mana. And if you have something that triggers whenever you gain life, then it, oh boy. I think a lot of people know it from the classic uh, Johnny's Pride Mate. Pride so one, <laughs> yeah, it gets... Kind of yeah. crazy. 
if you get I, good good triggers with this. I think these are the literally the best cards in life gain decks because they oh, will yeah. trigger all the time. And there's so many cards that say whenever you gain life, and it doesn't care about the amount of life, it's just that you're gaining life. And this will just go crazy with them. It's there's yep. so you can't ask for a better a better a life gain uh, generator in in a life gain deck than these one drops. There's three of them. They're really good. Outside of it, I think the biggest downside is like if you're just jamming in and in for value. I think a lot of people will just if they don't know who to attack, they're going to default to the person who has the highest yeah. life total. Yeah. And these are just <laughs> one ones. So unlike. MVP Sarah Senna, which is a 6 6 flyer <laughs> yeah. with lifelink, which you will be at the highest life total, but you can back it up. These are just one ones. You ain't blocking with them. So Sarah here's Senna, the high life total. It's going to shout out to my, my, my bro, uh, Sarah Senna, there. I like, I like Sarah Senna. These are just one ones. So if you are at the highest life total and I don't know who to attack, I'm attacking you and you're just going to take it because you're not blocking with these one ones. You get enough life though. You just get <laughs> no, <laughs> game the opponent. Yeah, that's fine. Have some I, creatures enter the battlefield. <laughs> I have it is is B. It's a card that I really usually only play in life gain decks uh, for the most part. But I'm also the person that every time Phil's plays it, I'm like always blown away at how good it looks. So I almost feel like I'm <laughs> underrating it as a B. And maybe it deserves to be like an A because we've seen some games where it really does just gain an absurd amount of life for one mana without putting any effort into it. So it's a card that I'm like on the fence about trying in more decks just for the the value line that that phil was talking about so i think i'm still at the like play it in all your life game decks and they're amazing there but it might actually deserve a little more credit to that because i am a big believer in like incidental life gain so maybe it's worth just like throwing one of these in your white weenie deck and you tutor up with your ranger vs or throw it in your elf deck because essence wardens an elf just to like gain some life <laughs> a card i've started to play a lot more for fun because of incidental life gain is that demon from the Warhammer decks, where if an opponent gains a life, they they lose it instead. <laughs> oh, God, <no. laughs> okay, that, that would make these cards a little worse, yes. <laughs> no, 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 of course, yes, it would. But I just thought about that right now. However, these cards, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't, I don't, unless you have a specific use for the life gain, I don't, they're very specific. I think you need them in a Soul Sisters deck, and that's about it. I'm not playing it in my, like, mono white deck or like i'm not gonna play soul us uh, whatever soul warden or whatever or a green deck i'm not gonna play essence warden unless i specifically need the life gain um it, I, I just don't think it's enough it's just a one one that may that just like essentially means i played a bunch of like tranquil coves and get attacked by people <laughs> yeah, as mentioned before life total. <laughs> right like i'm just gonna get hit all the time like people swing at you for a tranquil cove <laughs> yeah. I'm at 41. Yeah, those lines are all right. Hey, well, Chief, got you're at the highest life total because you play that tranquil go. I'm gonna hit yes. you for five. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna hit you for like like 11 infect because you gained a life. Oh, okay, sure. I guess. <laughs> Yeah, uh, maybe I, I should stop running the gain lands because of that. Like, I'll run just like a tap land instead of a gain land. <laughs> yeah, Wait, honestly, seriously? I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> no joke. So, I will play a guild gate. <laughs> uh, you're kind of right there. Like, would we play a one drop that just said ETB? Like, let's say eight life. We probably wouldn't play this. No, uh, no but this I is guess my than just... ETB gain eight. I yeah, think. yeah. I, since my deck in life goes damage. infinite with creatures entering the battlefield, I guess that's my justification for saying, Ooh, I guess. But it's just, I mean, first for the ratings, everybody has it at B, I have it at A. And mm -hmm. this A is like me thinking, wait, whenever I play it, it overperforms. So is it good in every deck? That's true. That is just my very limited uh, experience. But for me, I feel like it's an A. I also like having a lot of life. <laughs> Man, talking about like Soul One, and attack Sarah a Essence, yeah. I want to play life, life <laughs> yeah, gain Phil, again. Phil does need the life. <laughs> We're always yeah. trying to kill him because he's, he's always be like, busted. He, yeah, yeah, he's always like, well, if you let me live, I'm gonna blend thievery or thing, and then yeah, cast all missions true. and do the yeah. thing. I'm like, all right, Phil, so you you die now. <laughs> I, I love I love those cards, but I also would love to live. So yeah, <laughs> so it makes more sense in the fill deck for sure. You need that life cushion if you're being attacked anyway. Uh, but yeah, so triple B's and one A. We're gonna just shove it in the B slot. 
And we'll move on to my uh, pick, Esper Sentinel. This Ooh, one finally. had a lot of opinions. A lot of people thought a lot of different things about Esper Sentinel when it came out. Um, and it was kind of hard to kind of hard to analyze at, the, at least at the beginning I would say one of the harder cards to analyze uh, it's one white for an artifact creature human soldier one one and it has whenever an opponent casts their first non-creature spell each turn draw a card unless that player pays X for X is Esper Sentinel's power so they have to pay one if Esper Sentinel isn't pumped if it's just a one one uh, but it does scale up like if you put a sword on it if you grow plus one plus one counters if you have anthems on the ability uh, they will have to pay more than just one mana uh, for their first non-creature spell each turn. But after after the first non-creature spell is cast, they can cast subsequent non-creature spells and not have to worry about paying any more taxes on it. We've seen it played a lot since it's been released, so we all think it's pretty decent, right? But uh, our overall score for it is uh, S's. For everyone except for Krim, who has it as an A, which is still very high. So this might be the highest one drop uh, we've ever we've, we've uh, rated on the entire thing. I think, yeah, yeah. It's I mean, it's one I... of only two average S's. The other one was Haywire mm -hmm. Might, and that one we were kind of like eh, yeah. maybe an A, maybe an S. Like this one is clearly an S. I I, I am still as high on S for Sentinel as I was when it initially came out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, like it's been about roughly the same for me. Usually, in any kind of tier list, it's roughly around an, a B or an A. Uh, it's it's in specific decks. I I like it. It's a good card, but I I I don't see it as an auto include entirely yet. Um, just because like we as we mentioned before, auto includes. I once I start adding other colors, I don't rely on this anymore for card draw. Like it, this this is still like a, a pretty solid card though. So. I don't know. I like it. I don't know if I S like it, but I do like it. I might be. I, think. I might be a little bit closer to you because I won't put it in like a five color deck, but like I put it in most like mono color Duke. I'll put it all mono color decks, all two color decks, most three color decks. I don't know. This card is really ass. Wait, it's, in, it's in, in so good in three color decks. Yeah. I um, mean, unless it's like an artifact synergy or or humans <laughs> or or using its subtypes, I don't. I don't play it in three colors. I, I do play it in a few two colors. Obviously, mono white, yes, I will play it. Mm. I mean... And artifact synergies, definitely throw it in. Mm -hmm. I think our math backs up y'all underrating this card. Yeah. <laughs> like, didn't, didn't we math this out and you usually draw three cards and it costs one mana? Like, in Seth, five colors, four colors, three, three, three colors, <laughs> <Yes>. it, doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Three cards for one mana is, like, absurd it's, no matter what deck you're playing. We did a recording for an entire season. I think it was, like, two seasons ago that we did the math. Uh, if I find it, I'll put it on the on YouTube. Uh, but basically, I remember that it draws, like, more than three cards on turn one. And then the first... it. it it will draw a lot of cards in the first few turns, and then it has a steep drop-off. Like, if you play turn 8, it's probably got, not going to do anything. But on the first couple turns, it's, like, really good. Yeah. The ceiling is just so absurdly high, and the floor isn't that... Like, of course, if you draw it on turn 8, sure, that's pretty much the same for every one drop. But you either tax the first spell or non-creature spell they play every turn which is very impactful even though it doesn't feel like it for the active player but uh, the alternative is drawing a card a lot unless everybody oh, yeah. plays just creatures which, which happened before i think there was one esper sentinel that did nothing because everybody just played creatures but mm. on average i wasn't there that week i don't think <laughs> if, if I was there on average, even if Seth played <laughs> just creatures, he would find a way to draw. I find you a yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it just has to draw two cards yeah. and then it's busted. And it's a human. It's an artifact. It even gets better if you pump its power. It draws cards. It's just the most s one drop creature I think on this list and ever printed. And hopefully that stays this it way really because a little bit more power creep and it's not at all fun anymore. I mean, this, this is... Kind of <clears throat> is this the best one drop for Commander then? Like, I is this forever. number one I overall? So, yeah. Do we Are there even any other contenders that anyone would throw in to say, like, best overall one drop for the format? Because I think I would say Esper Sentinel. We like, have Haywire Might and we have... Creature. 
creature wise. The only thing that's close is is Haywire Might and Death Right Shaman in terms of our ratings. Hmm. Yeah. I'd even say like I'm also like borderline in A as well. Where like yeah, I won't run in all my decks, but I'll run in a in a very large amount. And there's so many decks that have inherent synergies with either humans, one drop creatures, or artifacts that like yep. I ended up running it a lot. But like I don't run it all my decks. Like my paper decks, I have like eleven, and I run it in a single one. But mostly because I don't like asking people if they want to pay the one. I just, <laughs> just doesn't that, in my uh, paper decks. I play it in two. Yeah. So, and I have about like thirteen decks as well. Yeah. So, I um, think yeah, it's also easier to play aren't, around. But aren't like. Twelve of those Demir, Cram, or Griffin. Yeah, no, no, no. you tell Esper, us the story one time. Esper. He likes Esper. Yeah, okay. Esper, come on, which is Demir base. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe this. I think this is our overall highest. I'm going to keep it at S just to say that we have an overall highest. I mean, it's also made it... like twenty four bucks, which kind of is a bummer if you're trying to put it in a bunch of different paper decks. You know what? Good. Stop asking people to pay the X. Leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, looking at this, I kind of want to put my birds of paradise up to s because the other one drop that i would say is close to this is a two on one birds of paradise that feels very impactful as well but otherwise as sentinel will hopefully forever be the most impactful in commander otherwise a dragon i won't have uh, again. yeah just just wait till the next commander lands. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, give it good. give it time give it we're time. probably it probably won't even be correct anymore by the time this podcast even comes yeah, out they know. might have God. spoiled a better one drop in jumpstart jumpstart yeah, 2022 the, the as we are recording this yeah, actually yeah, yeah. They, or they, yeah. with anime art <laughs> or, <laughs> they, or they have a new secret layer universes beyond that that oh, gets announced who knows the, the, the problem is like obviously ragavan is more power crap than this but the niche that Esper Sentinel occupies is like this kind of smothering tight Ristic Study style card, and I really hope we don't see this on more one drops. This is just not the way to make Commander fun. <laughs> <laughs> and a good thing it only triggers once each turn, but yeah. man, what a banger. I like that it's once each turn, and it's a lot easier to play around. Like, if you're in a creature heavy yeah. meta, it's not going to perform as well as your average meta. So it does. It is dependent, but I think overall, like we've seen, we've seen by the stats for our group, overall, over an entire season, it has just performed very well. You know, like yeah. if you're on average drawing three cards off this, yeah. that's really good for one draw. Didn't I mean, you draw like eight cards or something of it in EDH, uh, CDH week? Yeah. Everybody just... <laughs> oh, it's, it's oh, even yeah. better in CDH. It's, it drew me all yeah. the cards. They were all lands, but they were still, I was still drawing cards. It's <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So we're going to shove that into the S rank. And now we have four more cards. And what I'm going to do for this, since we are getting a little bit long, we're just going to do a lightning round. So everybody's going to introduce their card, say why they like it, say the ranking. We won't discuss it. No discussions. We'll just say it, say why we like it, ranking, and then we'll move on to the next one. We'll get those four done. And then, like I said before, you can find all of our rankings, all 30 ish of them, uh, in the uh, article that we're going to post alongside it. So we're going to start things off with Seth. What is the final card here? Uh, why do you like it? What's the ranking? My final card is Weathered Wayfarer. Weathered Wayfarer is a one mana, one, one white creature. It's a human nomad cleric. You can pay a mana. You can tap it. You can search your library for a land, not a basic land, a land. Reveal and put it in your hand. Only can do it if an opponent has more lands than you. So kind of worded like land tax in that way where it's a, it's catch up ramp, but it's not actually ramp. It's catch up land tutoring. And that's why I really like this card. Rating wise, A, 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 except for C from Krim. Uh, so most of us like it except for Krim. The power of this card is we keep getting more and more strong lands. Uh, we've been talking about Urza Saga. We've been talking about channel lands, all these really powerful utility lands that Wizards keeps giving us. Weathered Wayfair is just a great way to find those cards. And it works even well with white catch-up ramp because you can tutor up bounce lands or things like that that are a Lotus Field that'll put you down lands to turn on your other ramp. So I think this is just, uh, an essential piece to your white land slash ramp package that you should probably play in most mono white decks. Okay, very sweet, very sweet. Krim, what do you got for your final card? Uh, I have another white one drop. Recruitment <laughs> Officer, a new one. 
Um, I kind of want to talk about this because mostly I I just really liked uh the two the it, the fact that it's just a two one right, but like the fact that you could pay four mana and to start digging for creatures three or less. Um, I, I, I like that. Maybe you have like X amount of mana to spend. This is just a fun mana sink, something to always keep you like, or at least help you dig towards action. And you can do it at instant speed where in a, in 2022, they tried to make everything activate only at sorcery speed. So I like this. It may not seem like much, but it's a way to just constantly refill your hand or get more action. Uh, and something to do so white hasn't had a ton like I mean I like the mana sinks that white has uh, but I, I this is on a one drop and it's on a one drop that it, you know like it, it, I, I, I'm here for this simple as that it's just a sweet one drop that has a simple ability uh, nothing more nothing less and then rankings we got two B's uh, Seth and, and Krim B me and Phil C and then we'll move on to Phil. What's your final card here? Uh, my final card is Shrieking Drake. One mana, one one flying. When it enters the battlefield, return a creature you control to its owner's hand. Old wording, so you can return itself to its owner's hand. And then you can play X mana and have X creatures enter the battlefield, leave the battlefield, whatever you want to abuse this for. No fair way to use this, but... It's just a very, very unique card because they will never do the mistake of missing the another word on this again. And it's just, it is a pretty powerful card, even though it looks very dorky. And I like it. Uh, the ratings are B, B, C, and B. Uh, C from Krim. Uh, yeah, it is very, it is very much a B. Even I ranked it as a B. It is super specific. But uh, hey, if you play Trulane or Lonis or any other commander that so uh, wants Flicking so combo. Good. Oh yeah. my god, it's so good. <laughs> yeah. Anything with like Godama or like the new Phyrexian perm like the Phyrexian man you can make up you can spend oh, of blue yeah. Phyrexian mana. Yeah. yeah. The combos. Defiler, I think, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So many combos with this. It's just oh very unique cut. And very old and very cheap still. So yeah. get your hands on it if you need it. Hashtag yeah. MTG Finance. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Alright, and then the final card to round out the list. This is my final pick. Ragavan Nimble Pilfer. For those who don't know about this little uh, underrated gem. Stupid it's a red 2-1 legendary creature. Monkey Pirate. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, create a treasure token and exile the top card of that player's library. Until end of turn, you may cast that card. And you can dash it in for 2 mana, which means you just put it onto the battlefield, it has haste, and then at the end of turn, you return it back to your hand. Um, this one, really, really good uh, early game. Like, as an early drop, it is fantastic. If you get it onto the battlefield before people have blockers, or at least one person, one opponent doesn't have a blocker, you get to get in there, you get to make a treasure, so it's already ramping you, and you can get card advantage as well, and the treasure is going to help you cast that spell too. Um, late game, obviously it's a 2-1, so it's going to be having difficulty attacking, but it pairs really nicely with evasion effect. So if you have a deck that has a lot of eva evasion, then Ragavan can continue to be generating tons of value for you throughout the game. And our, our ranking is unanimous, just A's across the board. So this is one of the higher ranking cards that we have on our list. And that's going to be it for this podcast, everybody. Uh, again, if you want to find all of our ratings, we're going to have that linked in the article on mcgoldfish.com. Um, so we ranked like 30 or so cards. You can find all the rankings over there. I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Let us know what you think about the cards that we discussed. If you agree, disagree. If there are any notable cards that we missed on our big list, uh, there definitely will be some. Uh, next time, we're probably going to be discussing uh, one-drop non-creature spells because we we had we wanted to do all one-drops, but it ended up being such an enormous list that we want to have a little bit of a focus here. So you can tune into that. We're going to be doing other other uh, mana values as well that we're going to be ranking. There's so much things we can rank. There's never enough tier lists. And, and obviously, if you want, if you have any recommendations on what uh, subjects we should be covering on a future podcast, please let us know in the comments section or send us an email. Uh, that's always very helpful. So yeah, like and subscribe. And until next time, friends, see ya.